Uh, again, I'm acting as the session moderator. Uh, you won't hear too much from me here along the way. My only ask is that you do please utilize the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions of our presenter. Um, with that, I have the, the privilege of handling, handing the floor over to Dr. Paul Vixie. Uh, he's currently the Chairman CEO co-founder of Farsight Security. And he's here to talk to us today about deploying DNS over HTTPS without confrontation. Dr. Vixie, over to you, sir. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for uh, coming by. Uh, there are many stages of grief. When I gave a talk related to this topic in Edinburgh, I think that was anger. And uh, I may be in negotiation now. Uh, so let me bring you up to speed as to uh, what this is, DNS over HTTPS is part of something, uh, and try and explain why it, the default is confrontational, and then what we might be able to do on a sort of network by network basis to uh, uh, sort of adopt this uh, future or a version of this future. So let me march right in. Uh, some of this will be uh, old hat to those of you who have uh, followed the bouncing ball of my DNS Wars talk. Um, first, let's talk about the DNS system architecture. Uh, this has not really changed in the 30 plus years of DNS operation. Uh, we've been uh, using stub resolvers in our hosts that now include smartphones, laptops, virtual servers, et cetera. And we have got authority servers, uh, which is tends to be bind or not or something like that. But there are a lot of different ways to get data into the system. But uh, whatever you're doing, whether it's a zone file or a program or a database, whatever it is that uh, from DNS's point of view, that is an authority server. So you have questions coming in from the bottom, coming from users and applications, answers coming in from the top, uh, they meet in the middle at that thing that I'm calling the recursive server, which is also known as a full resolver for reasons which don't concern us. <clears throat> now, um, some of the things you have to know about why this works and why it works this way are first that the conversations between the stub resolvers, that's your smartphone, and the recursive server, which uh, might be 8.8.8.8 if it's Google or might be whatever your enterprise or ISP has, has assigned you. Um, that conversation, since it contains your IP address and connects your IP address to every question you ask, it is deeply PII, personally identifiable information. Um, so you really wanna keep that data path uh, on a close hold. You only wanna send your queries to someone you trust to hold your PII or to not hold your PII, but whatever it is, someone you trust, someone who's under the same legal regime, uh, possibly somebody who is uh, you know, under contract of some kind, like an ISP, or perhaps you're running this server yourself. They've, there have been open source uh, recursive server implementations for the entire lifetime of the DNS, going back to the mid 1980s. And not all of them were as high quality as those of today, but then it's always been possible to run your own. Um, finally, let me say that the reason this system has scaled is because of that cache on the left, where if someone else who shares that recursive server with you has recently asked the same question you're asking, you will get a very fast response, which will be a copy of the response that somebody else caused to be fetched. Um, and that's how we got eight, nine orders of magnitude uh, out of a single architecture. So uh, very simple, very impressive, doesn't really uh, explain its own wow function because it uh, works, works so well. Um, after commercialization and privatization, when it became possible to purchase internet service from an ISP, this is kind of the system topology. Uh, so roughly speaking at Y2K, your users and applications are you know, connected somehow to a LAN, maybe it's Wi-Fi, uh, maybe it's a, a wired ethernet, uh, I don't know, Bluetooth, a personal area network, whatever it is, you've got to connect somehow to the internet and you're gonna do that 
through a local area network that then might be part of a campus uh, or a building or something else. Uh, then it has a connection to some ISP or maybe more than one. And that ISP's job is to connect you to the internet. Uh, and that kind of, again, that, that kind of worked. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about the internet so much today. Um, now I've heard the aphorism that money changes everything, but actually it's only true because money is power and power is what changes everything. Uh, so let me show you uh, some of the steps. I'm gonna summarize this as uh, briefly as I can uh, that got us to encrypted DNS in general and DOH in particular. First in Y2K, uh, there was an attempt to put a wildcard at star.com. And what a wildcard means is there are no negative answers. And that meant that for a, a brief time uh, before the lawsuit started and before those were concluded, uh, you, no matter what question you ask, if it ended in .com, you got an answer, a positive answer. And this caused a lot of trouble, but it was ultimately a revenue enhancement play by the uh, registry for .com, which was VeriSign. They had a partner called SiteFinder that they were uh, using to derive ad revenue from those positive but falsely positive responses. Um, so this was hugely controversial and it ended in tears and ultimately uh, went away, uh, but it helped set the stage for what came later, which is DNS was uh, sexy and DNS was a way that you could advance your own innovation and uh, maybe shift some costs, but one way or another, uh, answering questions privately and without drama uh, has become a little more rare. Uh, so around the middle of the first decade of, of this new century, OpenDNS said, you know, you don't need to use your ISP name server. You don't need to run your own. You can use ours. And they had a pretty reliable service that uh, is present in many cities through uh, IP Anycast. And um, the way that they decided they were going to pay for this was with NX domain redirection. In other words, the same thing VeriSign had done a few years later, but done in the middle of our architecture at the recursive server, rather than being done at the top. Either way, you're trying to sell ads by giving people falsely positive answers, um, even if what they asked for didn't exist. Uh, this didn't raise too many eyebrows until they decided to redirect www.google.com to an open DNS search page because they treated that as the search utility and they just wanted to offer their own. And it wasn't really their own. They, they redirected all of those uh, search queries to Google, but it gave them a chance to data mine the answers and data, or excuse me, data mine the questions. They could then associate with your IP address what strings you were searching for, which of course Google also does. Uh, although Google uses cookies and I think this was, was done with IP addresses. Now that is shortly before Google created 8.8. .8. Maybe they had it in the, in the works. Maybe this was their response. They're not talking. Around 2010, we got something called eDNS client subnet. And that's because if, you, if everybody who is using your website that is on a CDN like Akamai, for example, if they're all coming to you through OpenDNS, then there is no longer any correlation between the DNS query that you use to learn the address of a web server and the HTTP or HTTPS fetch that you then do subsequently. And it was that correlation that made the CDN possible. In other words, that they used your DNS question to predict your location for a later HTTPS transaction. That stopped working when people stopped using recursive name servers on their LAN, on their campus, or on their ISP. So what EDNS client subnet was designed to do is bridge that gap so that you would send your network address uh, to the authority server from the recursive server uh, to say, by the way, this is uh, who's asking. This is the network where this question came from. Please give me an answer that is correct for that, that or optimal rather, uh, for, for that end network. Um, that was the state of play when Edward Snowden famously uh, flew to Hong Kong with a whole bunch of government data, uh, which about which much has been said and written. 
so I'm, I'm not going to recount any of that here. But I will say that the very next year, we got RFC 7258 talking about pervasive monitoring and how that it was a bad thing. And the IAB Internet Activities Board then recommended, let's just not do that anymore. Um, so um, this is the new topology, where instead of just going to the internet and using it, you went through the internet to reach your recursive before going through your internet to reach your CDN. And the recursive was now leaking your information across the internet to that CDN. And that's just, those were just business uh, moves. Nobody planned this. This is just what we got. Um, so because of all this pervasive monitoring that was occurring because these transactions are now going so far from home before they get answered, uh, the IETF created two standards. First, DNS over TLS, and uh, then DNS over HTTPS. And uh, to give you an idea of when this happened, there was a two-year period during which we had DOT, uh, just DNS over TLS, uh, before we got DOH. Um, and the problem with uh, DOT from the IETF's point of view is that while we now had privacy, and we had authenticity, we could be sure the transaction was not being tinkered with. Um, it was still possible for the ISP or indeed anyone on the path to block it. And being having the ability to block it, especially given nation states the ability to block it was considered unacceptable. So uh, we got DOH and this year we just got RFC 8890 where the IAB is doubling down on all of this and saying the internet is for end users and everyone else needs to get out of the way and let those end users do what they do. Uh, sounds like a political statement to me, but um, nevertheless, there's an RFC for it. So here's the new topology, uh, same thing, except we've added some stuff on the right, my team did, so the recursive server operator can now monitor their traffic and even interfere with it for maybe ad blocking reasons or malware blocking reasons. Um, and there's still a firewall that prevents the, uh, any of those stubs from sort of bypassing that and going straight out to the internet. Only the recursive is allowed to speak DNS to the authority. Uh, but now there's this thing on the left, which is applications doing DNS. And they're doing it over DOH, which is very difficult to firewall, so it just bypasses all of that. So whatever monitoring you were doing, whatever filtering you were doing is gone. Um, so I want to say this is not the end. A lot of enterprises run a man in the middle gateway for their HTTPS traffic. Um, they can't anymore. They won't be able to. TLS 1.3 with ECH, which used to be ESNI is now ECH, uh, makes that impossible. You just don't have enough information at the corporate gateway to know how to intercept to be the man in the middle on HTTPS. So if you're using a next gen firewall or if you're depending on one or you know someone who is, you should let them know that the days are numbered where that will work. And soon we're not gonna see that traffic. Um, now, I wanna say that this is a difference between the internet and the web. On the internet, it was a network of networks and every network was considered, I don't know, autonomous. Um, that's just unacceptable in a web world. And in uh, 2000, Lawrence Lessig said uh, famously that code is law, uh, but this is the information age and um, information superiority kind of uh, requires that you not let other people intercept or, or observe the information that is necessary to your success. Uh, in 1990, an open system meant you could change it. Um, today, it just means you can fork it. Uh, see Android for an example. Um, so again, in the internet, all of these intermediaries had the ability to move out of alignment and say, I'm not gonna carry that traffic, whatever that might be. It's some you know, maybe AUP violation or something else. Um, now, let me just say, if you like me, forget which way the direction of entropy points, just uh, remember uh, that small human children, uh, when they are first able to walk, will move everything of like kind to be evenly uh, spaced throughout your house. Uh, there will be, in other words, junk everywhere. And there will be no pattern to it. That's high entropy. Um, and what 
we are looking for if we're trying to prevent any of these intermediaries from seeing or modifying or blocking traffic is high entropy. So uh, an example of perfect entropy would be compression. Uh, another would be encryption because the output of either of those processes will be something that is completely unintelligible, uh, has no pattern, high entry, infinite entropy, or at least perfect entropy. So that's what that looks like, uh, which is that the user is now connected to the service and the, the intermediaries cannot understand what's going on. They can't uh, then make policy decisions about whether to carry it or not. It is, uh, it's a, a state of such high entropy that you don't know who they're talking to, what they're asking for, or what they're getting. And that might seem like a good thing uh, if you're maybe a dissident uh, living in a country whose government doesn't want you to use the internet. But uh, it's not necessarily a good thing if you're, I don't know, on a, a CISO trying to secure a uh, corporate network. So um, everybody looks the same on the wire. Everybody looks like a nation state. Um, and the protocols are evolving to deal with nation states who are doing the things that Edward Snowden pointed out they were doing. So uh, where are we? Um, we've got uh, DOT is a, available in most recursive and authoritative servers, but it's not used very much. Some versions of Android use it or can use it if you turn on DNS privacy, but um, they're not, uh, that's not the default. Um, and the reason this is so hard is because the X509 certificate system doesn't make it easy to have an IP address as your common name or your uh, server alt name. Um, it, it's in the spec, but not everybody implements it, which means you don't know as the client in this case, how to validate that the certificate you're getting came from the person you thought you were talking to. Um, so the DOT is having a rough start. It's two years older than DOH, but it's, uh, it's harder to implement, harder to, to deploy. And so what we have is DOH coming later and uh, kind of taking, taking over everything. Firefox, very controversial, will turn on DOH, even if you haven't said that's okay with you. And they will select one of their trusted recursive resolvers. And then after they've done that, they'll ask you, would you like to change back to the less secure config? Um, Chrome, on the other hand, is willing to use DOH to whatever recursive server your operating system is using if it works, uh, but they're not gonna select that server for you. They'll let you select a different server than your OS, but they, they, they don't automatically do it. And the other Chromium forks, I use Brave, are probably gonna wait and see what the uh, Apps Doing DNS Working Group of IETF does before they decide which way to jump. Windows next year, shortly, will start using DOH, but again, only if the server you're using supports it. Um, iOS and Mac OS uh, will use DOH uh, if you make a system-wide config or if the app decides that it wants to opt in to that behavior. So any app on iOS or Mac OS is capable of bypassing the, uh, the, the recursive server that's been assigned. Now the um, MDM system can usually control the browser or the operating system and say, yeah, the, the local network admin who you know, has my keys does not want that to happen. And uh, you know, who knows, maybe that will be effective, but I think not. And there's a reason for that. Um, and that is there are a lot of end users that are very happy with this. They think that um, having their transactions not be monitored or interfered with by their network operator is a good thing. It's only really if you're a network operator, for example, family filtering or a CISO with corporate filtering or maybe some uh, ma mandated uh, oversight that they do, uh, those people are unhappy for the same reason, which is that DOH is a good anti-censorship system. And I, I wanna note, Google was sued by Comcast over DOH. And in that lawsuit, it was um, alleged that both companies are in the advertising business and Google is using their DOH advantage to disintermediate Comcast. Not sure everybody knew that Comcast was in the advertising business, but they said so in a lawsuit, which means that the pervasive monitoring we're talking about really has been happening. Um, 
Russia has already said they're not going to be allowing any of this new stuff. Um, now, they said ESNI, they mean ECH, but there are a lot of countries that are going to take this view. So a lot of stuff is about to break uh, because various people are going to play chicken with other people's traffic. Um, I noticed a day or so ago that uh, as a big sir, Mac OS no longer um, lets little snitch or any other firewall you have see all of the traffic. So FaceTime, for example, bypasses your own firewall. I guess Apple does not trust their own users to see what Apple's applications are doing. Uh, that seems like the opposite of the message in the 1984 Super Bowl commercial, but it is absolutely in keeping with what we're seeing here. And uh, HTTP itself is going to move to a very similar perfect entropy model uh, using something called Quick, which has no connect system call required. You can just, uh, if you have a UDP socket, you can speak, which means antivirus, ad blockers, and content filters won't know when a new transaction is beginning or to whom. And so all of that will have to move into the browser, uh, which I guess is good if you make browsers. So here's what you can do. All right, I've told you most of this before, but now I'm telling you what you can do about it. Um, and one thing you probably are not going to win at is uh, demand, making an explicit pro proxy and making everybody use it. Uh, I might be able to achieve that in my company, but I probably cannot achieve that with all the IoT gizmos in my house. Um, so I'm going to have to do something. And one thing you can do is look at Mozilla's uh, trusted recursive resolver rules. Again, I'm not a fan of Mozilla's policies in this area, but uh, they are setting a certain standard of limiting the data, how data is used by a recursive server. So pr maybe protecting that PII I told you about. Transparency as far as what they are doing with the data and not doing any filtering unless required by law. Okay, so again, I'm not in love with Mozilla's actions here, but they have set this standard. And Comcast, as an example, is someone who has adopted that. They've created a trusted recursive resolver capable system. It does and does not do all of the things that Mozilla demands. And they have asked to be listed as a TRR for Mozilla Firefox users. But that's a secondary concern. Uh, the, the, the more important point is that they can now claim validly so with auditors and transparency and so forth, that they are a safe place to send your DNS. They have exited this part of the advertising business. They're promising not to do the thing that they were accusing Google in that lawsuit of doing. You can do that too. You can run one of these servers and run it according to Mozilla's rules. And then you can turn on DOH so that you can legitimately claim to your users, your customers, your employees, that you're not doing bad things with their DNS traffic, that you are a trusted recursive resolver. Um, you're going to have to do that. If you don't do that, people are, I mean, people will bypass you anyway. Um, but if you give them this excuse, then more people will bypass you. And it's actually good to keep local DNS local. You don't want to go across the, uh, the whole internet to reach a recursive service. You don't want to put it in the hands of somebody who might be under a different legal regime and so on. So you really, in order to avoid confrontation, you have to go do this. You have to deploy it yourself Make sure everybody knows you've done it. Okay, so um, this is the information age. So it's not land, it's not sea, it's not air, it's not space, it's information. And whoever has information superiority gets to control their own business conditions and everybody else's. And the way this works is very simple. You surveil, you predict, and you control, uh, and you keep doing that. And you, you do that <clears throat> with everything. And so it's the surveillance capitalism model because it gives you power in the information age to do so. So whatever the internet protocols do and whatever the configuration defaults are now controls everybody's destiny. And you know, yes, we regularly see people leaving the surveillance capitalism world and saying, I hate the world I've helped create. I, I didn't realize it was gonna be this ugly. I didn't realize that I was helping bring George Orwell's nightmares to life. Yeah, but they do that after they've spent 10 to 20 years helping do stuff. So the regrets you're having later don't actually have much impact. 
Now, if you don't like what I'm talking about, if you don't want to go do this, you have to, I'm sorry, but if you don't want it to keep getting more like this, go join the uh, Apps Doing DNS Working Group. Uh, go join the Encrypted DNS Initiative. Uh, go get involved. Go get, let your voice be heard. I am one of the few from the security industry who is also interested in DNS and therefore shows up there. So mostly we've got DNS people deciding how DNS ought to work in a way that has profound implications on network security that they either don't know about or don't care about. They keep telling me my firewalls are 1990s technology. I should secure my endpoints. Yeah, well, let, me, let me show you my endpoint. Anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. We have a few minutes for questions. Thanks, Paul. We'll give folks a moment here. There are no questions open in the queue. You see that there, Paul? Uh, there's chat, I see. I gotta click on something. So I can just read for you if you want. No, I got it right here. You got it. Go Practical first. recommendation, which DNS provider for home user? Um, well, let me suggest that you should probably buy a Raspberry Pi. There are a lot of them. They're cheap. Uh, you could go even smaller. You could, uh, you know, there are cheaper ones, but uh, you should probably just install Linux and turn on whatever recursive server came with it and use that one. That's the best one you will ever find because it keeps your data local. You don't have foreign dependencies. You don't have or distant dependencies. You don't have risks. You don't have to do much of anything. But if you can't do that, if you, for whatever, if you're trying to set this up for your parents and you don't want to be a sysadmin for, for them for life, um, then really any of the so-called uh, public DNS servers uh, that have four numbers separated by three dots are likely to be trustworthy. Um, if you're a Comcast user, just let, use the ISP because Comcast has, uh, has come into conformity with, with these rules. Uh, it's worth, if you're in Europe, then your ISP is worried about GDPR and they're worried about PII. So they are also conforming to the same rules. So it's really only if you're outside of civilization where uh, we where dogs eat dogs that you need to worry about what a ISP might do uh, with your internet traffic. So you're perfectly safe in Canada. Uh, believe it or not, you're perfectly safe in China because they're, they care very much about who gets to see what people are doing. Um, so check out what's already happening. It may be fine. Otherwise, you know, I, I know people at Cloudflare. I know people at Google. I know people at uh, uh, Quad9 and they're all, they're all doing the right thing. They're doing what they say they're doing. So if you just can't use your ISP and you can't run your own and you have to adopt this modern way of doing things, then they're all pretty much okay. Uh, Pi-hole, good suggestion. Uh, the the Pi-hole people have done a good job of packaging a recursive server in tiny hardware. Um, and if you're worried about educational establishments who can't control their endpoints anymore because RPZ no longer works because the server's being bypassed, you may have to become confrontational. There may not be a cooperative way to solve that problem. So you may have to start uh, learning where the recursive name servers of the world are and blocking all HTTPS traffic to those IP addresses. Um, I don't like that world, but I don't know what I can do. I can't offer you a better, better answer really. Uh, the canary domain approach where you can make a query where the app will make a query locally to see if the local recursive server uh, doesn't really want you to bypass it you know, that'll work if everybody cooperates, but if uh, you have a malicious actor inside your network, they're probably not gonna make that query and they're not gonna care what your policy is. So that is a uh, fig leaf. Um, DOQ, the DNS over uh, quick, that's certainly coming, but um, it isn't here yet. And it'll probably be a little better just because you won't have all that TCP state. You'll have a fair amount of TLS state and HTTP3 state, or rather quick state, um, but it will at least lack some of the hit align blocking problems that uh, HTTP has. Um, 
recent cash poisoning studies. Um, yes, I think um, this recent thing where all of a sudden the Kaminsky attack is back on the table, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, um, you know, contact me by email, I'll send you some URLs. Um, and it is likely to cause another surge of DNS sec deployment because that's the real fix for any of this. Um, and it will likely be the excuse that a lot of uh, people who sort of want to be your DNS server will use to try to uh, twist your arm a little bit and get you to send your DNS traffic to them. Be careful that you understand what their motives are for that and what the side effects might be before you adopt it. Um, and uh, Chris- yeah, Actually with that, Paul, sorry, we're, uh, oh, we're about a minute right, over right. and we've only got about four for everybody to get over to the closing remarks. So um, I believe you can still follow up uh, via typed answers here on these. Um, appreciate the, the presentation, the update on where everything stands and the insights you were able to provide. Um, always good to see you, sir. Thanks with a that, lot. Bye -bye. wrap up, take care.